Hi everyone, CJ Grisham here, and I wanted to create a video to kind of explain something, uh, our reasons uh, for a decision that we made this week. And that decision is that we're going to drop our civil suits against the city of Temple, uh, Steve Ermis, Officer Minix. It's a, uh, it's a very difficult decision, but it was one that was made with a lot of thought and contemplation. And the reason I'm making this video is because as the media starts talking about this and, uh, and, and reporting on it, I wanted to make sure that all the facts were out there. The media can't tell everything. They're going to pick what parts they think make a great story. Um, so I wanted to make this video to really kind of flush out my thoughts on why uh, both Chris and I are dropping our, our lawsuits. Now let me tell you what led up to the lawsuit. My arrest is very well known. March 16, 2013, while hiking with my son out in the country on a road much like this one here. Uh, a police officer, Stephen Ermis, approached me from behind. The first thing I said to him after dropping my hands beside my, my body there to make sure he knew that I wasn't touching any firearms was, how you doing today? Hardly confrontational. His response was very authoritarian. Don't be touching it. So right off the bat, you could tell that he was going to try and assert some authority. So I said, okay. He said, what are you doing? I said, we're hiking. He grabs my firearm, my rifle, my hunting rifle that I had on me. He says, there's some reason why you've got this. He might as well have said, is there some reason why you're exercising your rights? Is there some reason why you're walking, breathing? Spending time with your son? No, no. He, he says, there's some reason why you've got this, talking about my rifle. Is there some reason you're exercising your rights? Who do you think you are? And my response is very plain, because I can. At that point, I think, uh, you know, Steve Ermis, the bully that he is, recognized that uh, I wasn't going to roll over on him, that I wasn't going to treat him like a king, that I wasn't going to, uh, you know, play his game of power. At that point, he tried to disarm me, and my natural reaction as a soldier, and I think what would be a natural reaction of just about any soldier when unexpectedly somebody, anybody, it doesn't matter if they're wearing a badge or not, grabs your firearm and starts to take it, my instinct was automatically to put my hands around the barrel and the rifle and say, hey, hey man, don't try and disarm me. And if you watch that video, I'm still very calm until he stomps on my foot with his 300 pound boot and puts a gun to my head. Everybody knows what happens after that. Sergeant, Steve, or Sergeant Thomas Minix came on the scene. Steve Ermis began lying to his supervisor about what happened. Uh, they even went behind the car where Officer Ermis unplugged his body mic, forgetting that, Steve, that uh, Sergeant Minix had his audio on. That's how we know what happened back there. He lies to his supervisor about what happened. And the supervisor, based on false information that Steve Ermis gave them, decided they were going to throw me in jail for resisting arrest. We went through two trials, two very corrupt trials. In the first trial, Officer Ermis, uh, let me back up a little bit. Not only did Officer Ermis lie to his supervisor, but he lied on his police report. Well, we called him out on his police report. So what did he do? He created another police report and he lied again on that police report. And if you go to my YouTube channel or this YouTube channel, uh, you'll see exactly what lies because I lay them out with photographic evidence using his own police report. So he lies on two police reports and then he, we get to trial, the first trial, and he lies on the stand. And Officer Sergeant Minix even has to admit that the information that was on the report and the information that he gave, was given by Steve Ermis was false. The trial, of course, ended in a mistrial. Instead of letting it go, they decided to retry the case. And what did they do the second trial? They just didn't put all these people on the stand that had to admit that Officer Ermis lied. So he lied again. Obviously, I was convicted of a Class B misdemeanor. I had to pay a $2,000 fine. That case is still in appeal. Unfortunately, we waited until hopefully the appellate court would hear uh, our appeal in that conviction. 
but we couldn't wait more than two years. In order to file a civil suit, uh, you have to file it within two years of the violation. So on March 15th, uh, exactly two years to the day, we filed our lawsuit against uh, the officers individually and the city. Uh, we ended up dropping the, the charges against the city and stuck with uh, the police officers. Uh, a federal judge threw our case out. We wanted to hear it in state court. We were, we were trying to sue them in state court. The state fought that and demanded that the trial be held in federal court. And you know how it is. The, the system protects itself and it was sent to federal court. Why? Because it's much harder in federal court to sue cops than it is in state court. And they didn't want to be sued. So the judge threw out my case and uh, we were preparing uh, for our appeal to the Fifth Circuit. As you know, the Fourth and Sixth Circuits have already ruled that open carry in and of itself doesn't constitute reasonable suspicion or probable cause. So we prepared for our Fifth Circuit case. In the meantime, my son's case uh, was also moving forward. I don't know if it's very well known, but you can look also on this YouTube channel and see the video of him uh, basically being kidnapped and forced to answer questions in spite of explaining to the officer and telling the officer, I don't want to answer any questions. He invoked his Fifth Amendment rights. He wasn't being detained, so he had no, no duty to give information. He wasn't being arrested, so he had no duty. And my wife was 20 feet away. So his case was not thrown out. Um, and we were proceeding with that one as well. However, what happened is uh, just a few weeks ago, the Supreme Court came down on a case that happened here in the Fifth Circuit, which Texas is a part of. Uh, there was a case in Texas where a law enforcement officer shot and killed a suspect who was running uh, from police. He uh, was getting pulled over for some kind of traffic infraction. Uh, I don't know if he had warrants or whatever, but he started running. Uh, what I do know is there were no violent crimes committed or, being suspect or he was suspected of committing or that he had warrants for him. So here he is, he's not stopping for the police, and I'm not debating whether or not that's a crime it is. The officer that is supposed to be laying down spike strips to stop this vehicle calls in and asks if he can shoot out the engine block of the car. He doesn't get a response, so <laughs> what does every, every cop want to do? Well, he uh, you know, escalates it straight up to violence and he shoots at the car as it's approaching. It's not a threat to anybody. He's not trying to run the cop off the road, uh, but the police officer shoots this man running from the police in the car uh, and kills him. <laughs> I would say that a car driving down a highway that now has a dead man in the driver's seat is probably more of a danger than what the guy was doing to begin with. Uh, the Fifth Circuit found that the officers did not have qualified immunity, that the family was allowed to continue with their lawsuit against the officers, which is why this is the case, because the, the family was suing for wrongful death. And uh, the Supreme Court took the case and just a few weeks ago uh, reversed the Fifth Circuit decision and said that, yes, the officers do have qualified immunity. In other words, if you run from a police officer, they can murder you. They can shoot you. But I guarantee you, if you or I were to get robbed right now and the suspect were to start running from you and you shot him, you and I would be in jail. Manslaughter, murder, something like that. So once that, that case came down, unfortunately, right in the middle of our preparing for the Fifth Circuit, we recognized that, you know what? Yeah, we can fight this but the likelihood that we're gonna win, especially now, because the Fifth Circuit just got slapped down on qualified immunity. Do you think they're gonna overrule the federal judge who said that these cops have qualified immunity? No. What the Supreme Court did is once again, give the police more authority than you have rights. These days, the police can now pretty much do whatever they want to you. And there's nothing you can do about it. Your rights mean nothing. The courts, the state, the prosecutors, the judges, everybody is invested in making you a criminal. 
So we recognize that. We recognize that this is an uphill battle. It's not just an uphill battle, but now it's an impossible battle. There's no way the Fifth Circuit is going to overturn a qualified immunity case when they just got slapped down by the Supreme Court on a qualified immunity case. So we sat and we wondered, well, what are we going to do? Do we keep fighting it like we should? They need to be held accountable. We need justice. And then we thought about it. And we discussed this as a family. And the simple fact is that no matter what we do, whether we win, whether we lose, it doesn't matter. Because in the eyes of the public, everybody that's seen that video, everybody that's, that's followed this case, except for those that, that believe that when a police officer says jump, you're supposed to jump twice. If a police officer says bend over, you're supposed to spread your cheeks. So with the exception of those people, people who can think objectively recognize that I was doing nothing wrong and the police were wrong. And they're always going to believe that. Officer Ermis is a laughing stock of the public. Officer Ermis is a laughing stock here in Temple. I get emails all the time. Hey, CJ, I saw your friend at a gas station, or I saw your friend at Walmart, or I saw, and of course, they're talking about Officer Ermis. And generally, they always follow it up with, I can't believe that guy's still in uniform. I can't either. It is what it is. But what I do know is that Officer Steve Ermis has no credibility. He lied on the street, he lied in his police reports, and he lied in the court of law. He's a liar, he's a bully, he's a thug. Unfortunately, he's still a police officer. But Officer Ermis knows. He knows he was wrong. He knows he screwed up. Whether he wants to admit it or not, he knows he screwed up. Thomas Minix knows that Ermis screwed up. The city knows that Officer Ermis screwed up. Jim Nichols, the county attorney, knows that Officer Ermis screwed up, and the prosecutor, John Gant, knows that Ermis screwed up. The judge knows that Ermis screwed up. For the rest of their lives, they know that. But there's some good stuff that came out of this. Come January 1st, we've got open carry. So while we're criticizing Ermis for being the thug bully that he is, uh, let's thank him. Thank him for helping us get open carry passed uh, because we couldn't have done it without him. And from now on, people are going to look worse upon him than they look worse than they look upon me or my son. My son's about to retire. Or, let's retire. My son is about to uh, graduate high school and he's already looking at colleges and he's already starting to apply to colleges and I'm proud of him. He's number two in his class. And, and this, this whole case has affected him uh, because it's been a fight. It's been very stressful. It's been very expensive. Uh, but we want to get on with our lives. And the only way we can do that is with closure. And if we don't close it, we're, we're going to be in litigation for years. Now, I want to make something clear. Selfdefensefund.com, in my case, was ready, prepared, and willing to go all the way up to the Supreme Court with this. So this wasn't a decision made by my attorneys. <coughs> this was a decision that I went to them with. And they kind of agreed with my assessment. I mean, they gave me all the tools and the information. Uh, hey, CJ, read this case. Read this case. We could probably use this case. Um, th this is the case that was used in the recent Supreme Court case. And so we thought about it for a few days, and we discussed it as a family, and we decided it's just best to stop the case. So this has nothing to do with self-defense fund. They are still fighting in my criminal case, which we're still waiting on an appeal for. We're almost at two years since we filed it. Um, so they are still fighting in that case. Uh, but we had a choice with Chris's case to keep fighting it, uh, take out another loan to keep fighting it, which we were fully prepared to do, or move on. And uh, we've decided to move on. The fight's not out of me. If Steve Ermis came up to me again today and I'm carrying my rifle, I would do the exact same thing. But I guarantee you one thing. He wouldn't do the exact same thing. I guarantee you that Steve Ermis has learned his lesson. And he would handle that situation a little bit differently. As a matter of fact, Temple Police Department, uh, after a couple of uh, speed bumps after my arrest, they, they learned as well. And uh, I think they've grown a little bit for it as well. So... That's why I'm doing it. Uh, I don't want anyone to think I'm just giving up, but uh, 
you know, do you fight a battle um, to lose the war, or do you fall back from a battle and regroup to fight them in other ways? And the ways that we're going to fight them is in the legislation. So what this has encouraged me to do is uh, to pass better laws that deal with qualified immunity, to take away qualified immunity from police officers that violate departmental policy. If you violate a departmental policy, you are not operating under the color of law and you do not get qualified immunity. Because that's exactly what Steve Ermis did, was violate departmental policies. When he did what he did to me, and he violated departmental policies when Minix did what he did to my son. So I hope that explains everything. If you got any more questions, put them in the comments down below. Um, the other good thing is, you know, Open Carry Texas would have never been possible without Steve Ermis. Uh, so we, we really need to, to thank him as well. Uh, 10 o'clock on January 2nd, there's going to be a thank you for open carry Steve Ermis rally right there at Temple Police Department. Uh, that's January 2nd, 2016, if you're watching this video afterwards. And, uh, yeah, so there you have it. Uh, what, what the county should have done and what the city should have done, I'm doing right now. And that is I'm being the better person. I'm dropping this case and I'm moving on and putting it behind me so that I can grow, so my family can grow, so my son can grow, and we can have a better life not having to worry about uh, fighting and uh, trying, to, trying to fight a system that no longer represents you and me, that no longer ensures justice, uh, that prefers the, the authority of cops over the rights of the people. And that is something I'm going to continue to fight on a broader scale to make sure that none of you ever have to go through what I went through. Have a great day. Take care. Thanks for the support.